The Tom Woods Show, episode 2118. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I'm giving away three free courses from my Liberty Classroom. One of them is ex-Marxist Michael Rechtenwald teaching you about critical theory so you can understand leftism and fight it better, as well as our course on how Alexander Hamilton screwed up America and the history of the conservative and libertarian movements. Check it out at 3freecourses.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, I could not be happier to be speaking today to Robert Barnes. He is the founder of Barnes Law LLP. He has represented numerous high-profile individuals, Wesley Snipes, Alex Jones. He was on the Kyle Rittenhouse defense team, numerous others. But he's also an extremely interesting political commentator. And I'm glad I finally have a chance to talk to him. Robert, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. When you get to be my age, you find that more and more people you respect are younger than you. I listen to you and you have, I find you have interesting opinions well beyond the law. And I thought to myself, this guy must have five, 10 years on me. I'm older than you. What kind of world is this? Anyway, small observation as we start. But I want to ask you, uh, I have a bunch of things I want to ask you, but can you start by explaining, I mean, it doesn't matter in terms of your legal career, really, strictly speaking, but since you're kind of a public commentator on a lot of things, how would you describe your worldview? to somebody who's brand new to you? Sure. Uh, Old school American populist with a constitutional civil liberty streak and occasional anarchistic tendencies. Oh, okay. Uh, Occasional anarchistic tendencies is uh, interesting to me. But let's just say that set of ideas is not exactly what's being promoted from every official opinion molding outlet in American society. So everybody has some kind of I hate to call it a conversion story, but it's not like you were sitting in your third grade class and it all hit you because your teacher urged you to believe this. What kind of experiences you had that led you down this path? Sure. I mean, I think that most Americans, and in fact, there's a lot of sort of global movements that have a strong populist impulse, but what it's underrepresented in the intellectual, professional, managerial classes, if you will. And so it was a set of beliefs that I kind of instinctively had in part due to life experience, grew up in a working class family, in part because of growing up in America and in part growing up at you know, the uh, evangelical Protestant tradition, growing up in Tennessee, all of those things sort of reinforced it. But I would say it's just a deeply American tradition that I came to understand, be able to sort of self-articulate, to understand its architecture and design when I was actually a young intern in Washington, D.C. as a, during, while I was a scholarship student at Yale, my first freshman year, I spent the summer in D.C. And I did it interning at the White House and at the AFL-CIO and uh, living in Georgetown with like six other students. And this was the beginning of what I call the West Wing era in terms of the TV show. And that was a lot of the professional class was taking over D.C. politics. But I was witnessing that. But I came, went to a bookstore, which was one of my favorite things to do is to sort of wander around bookstores and read whatever I could for free without buying. And I came across T. Harry Williams' biography of Huey Long. And that's really what I was like, oh, this guy and this history explains what I believe and why I believe it. From there, that led me to Kevin Phillips. And I read everything he ever wrote from the emerging Republican majority to Boiling Point to Cousins War to everything in between. And then I I understood how to articulate what my inherent but incohate ideas were, which is a populism. And then my legal background reinforced the civil liberties aspect that was always there, Bill of Rights. My forefathers, all the Barneses in Rhode Island, voted against the original Constitution because it did not include a Bill of Rights. So that has some old ancestral history. And then I would say the anarchistic tendencies came from my old history professor who used to call himself the founder of the Redneck Anarchist Club. He was a Quaker from North Carolina. And there was just distrust. Anybody studies history long enough, you learn to distrust the state and the concentration of power. Though that was probably best exemplified for me at a governor's school program when I was in high school. The good governor, old school populist Democrat in Tennessee created this governor's school program for high school kids. One was for art, one was for 
some other things. And the one I went to was for international studies. And it was basically a bunch of working middle-class kids from across the state who got to hang out together in Memphis for a month on the government's dime, getting to do things. That was when they were commemorating the Civil Rights Museum. So you got to see Maya Angelou, got to see Jesse Jackson speak in the, in the same church that Martin Luther King gave his last speech in, last sermon in. And during that time period, they would take us through these experiments. And they took us through some experiment that was meant to explain currency, but what it really explained was power. In other words, you learn to look around the room and say, four people in this room of 100 are going to rule the rest of us. What's the likelihood that that four group of four people are the people who should rule the rest of us? And what is the likelihood that they are the worst people in the whole room? And chances are who's going to seek the power and who's going to be successful in seeking the power. And that anytime you give a small group of people disproportionate power over everyone else, you're going to end up with sociopaths governing you more often than not. And that's where the anarchistic tendencies come from. Yeah, well, it's hard to dispute that. Let me ask you something really blunt. You were part of the Kyle Rittenhouse defense team. And um, as that legal drama unfolded before us, all the respectable commentators were letting us know how much they didn't like that judge. They were letting us know how unsophisticated he was because I think they could see the writing on the wall because I think they felt like they could see that he seemed to be sympathetic to Rittenhouse, so they were just letting him have it. But that kind of makes me wonder, even though we're told that the law, at least in principle, is supposed to be impartial, it's this platonic thing that politics doesn't enter into. Well, if I'm a Kyle Rittenhouse It seems to me that that's not really the case. It seems that it just depends on what judge I wind up with and what kind of tribal affiliations that judge has and what kind of prejudices that judge has that will then, of course, be translated into a lot of nice-sounding legalese. But really, it's going to be a matter of, did I roll the dice well? Now, am am I too cynical? No. I mean, in fact, that was my argument with in law school. In my first year, we had a criminal law professor who uh, said, we want to be governed by law, not by men. And I asked him, I was like, who do you think writes those laws? Who do you think interprets those laws? Who do you think enforces those laws? He said, we're always governed by men. And maybe these men care about whether or not they are perceived as listening to the law, and that might matter, but we're never governed by the rule of law. That's a mythology. And what you see with judges, judges basically determine and dictate whether you get a fair trial or not in a criminal case. I mean, Kyle was unique in that most criminal defendants, most people who are targeted by the state or targeted by the system, in other words, the media is aligned against them, the political actors and institutional players are aligned against them, they usually get hostile judges. Kyle got a judge who was just willing to be fair to him. That was about it. I mean, this is a judge who could have, and in my view, should have dismissed a bunch of charges earlier on in the case, should have dismissed charges when the prosecutor engaged in egregious misconduct in the case. Generally didn't because he was known as a pro-prosecutor judge. He was just sympathetic to Kyle's case because he understood what happened that, that night in Kenosha in his hometown and reflected a broader attitude in that community. But your fundamental assumption is correct in the sense that the illusion is that we are governed by these impartial platonic guardians of something that we consider like the law as if Moses brought it down from God on the mountain. But in reality, we're always governed by men. And it's only how good or bad they are that the law itself gets upheld. Did you ever read an article by a guy named John Hasnes called The Myth of the Rule of Law? I don't know if I've read that specific article, but I'm aware of the idea. Yeah, because that's basically, it's basically what you just said. And It was a thesis that I resisted as a young, naive student for a long time. But it puts me in mind of something I read when I was in college. Richard Pipes was still alive. He was a really great Soviet analyst, and he's written some great books on the Russian Revolution and communism. And he said that when the Bolsheviks took over, the idea of law became divorced from the idea of accumulation of decisions from the past and and we defer to the past and we have this big body of law and case law that's built up over the decades and centuries that we consult when deciding cases, it shifted. Instead, what was necessary to be a judge was not that you had any acquaintance with all this material, but rather that you had a sufficient revolutionary consciousness and that would be sufficient to evaluate cases. Now, we're not quite there yet, but that is still a a system that's not a million miles removed from where I think some people, frankly, would like us to be. 
Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, in fact, that revolution has come to more full bear since the 1990s. So I went to law school in, in the late 90s and it was already present. And so we had like a legal writing class. First year, we're supposed to be teaching legal writing. And the assignment was to pretend that we were a young associate in a uh, bigger law firm and that the partner asked us for an objective analytical view on whether or not there was a particular loss of consortium claim for a handicapped child whose parent had suffered injury. The law in Wisconsin, due to a range of reasons, going back to the fact that children were only valued for their labor back at, in the beginning of the 1900s in many uh, states in the country in terms of what legal remedy and relief was available, had a hard cap and said that didn't matter what the reason was, an adult child, once you're 18, you no longer could make any recovery for loss of care of a parent, period. Didn't matter what the circumstances were. That's what the law was. So that's what, you know, wrote a legal memo that said that. Kept getting bad grades. And I was like, well, why is this? Well, it turned out the quote unquote correct memo, the quote unquote correct analysis was to pretend that the objective law reflected one's subjective preference. Everybody wants the handicapped adult child to recover. And so the analysis was supposed to be, we were supposed to lie to ourselves and to our theoretical hypothetical boss that yes, there's a valuable claim here and that the law supports a claim even when it didn't. It would be one thing if this was an advocacy class, but it wasn't. It was supposed to be objective analysis of the law. They were already teaching, take your subjective values pretend those are the objective realities and impose it accordingly and lie to yourself and others. And we're seeing it now reflected in the people who grew up under that law school education are now judges increasingly. And it's only going to get worse because the system got much worse in the after 2010. But a lot of your Obama appointees, I mean, some of your Clinton appointees, but it was much worse with your Obama appointees. I can go in and I know in advance that if I'm on the wrong political side, I will never get justice, period. It just won't matter. It won't matter what the facts are. It won't matter what the legal issues are. I'm done. I'm DOA. Whereas, I mean, the irony is with a Trump judge, I got 50-50 shot. Right? Yeah. They don't follow politics with consistency. Consequently, that's what gives the left an edge. Because when they are perceived to be right on the facts or the law, they'll mostly win with Trump judges. And they'll always win with their own judges. But when they're wrong on the facts and the law, they'll still win with their judges. And at least some of the times, you know, when judges make errors like everyone else, with Trump judges. And so what he's describing, the sort of, you know, it's kind of like the book, The Managerial Class on Trial, and this general premise that the professional managerial, clerical, bureaucratic class, these inquisitors for the cathedral, began to really seize power across the globe in the 20th century. And they just disputed amongst themselves whether to be communist, fascist, or sort of uh, corporate liberals, as I call them, in the West. But they're the same group of people running the world, and they think whatever their worldview is is what's best, and they contort the law to reflect their personal and class biases and values rather than actually the idea of the law, which is the common law tradition, the constitutional law tradition, they don't believe in it. And we're facing a sort of a brave new world in terms of what the legal environment's going to look like as more and more of these people become judges. I remember back in the uh, late 80s into the 90s, the fashionable thing in the law schools was a Marxist-inspired school of thought called critical legal studies. Now, I kind of assumed that that more or less fizzled out but yet I feel like the law schools are probably much worse now than they were then. And you've said that things have gotten worse. I know there's the Federalist Society, but they're a small handful of people. And when they hold an event, usually they hold the event without incident, but people view them with suspicion, even though generally all they want to do is hold debates. Once in a while, they want to have a debate on campus. Where do the law schools stand today? And are there any good prospects in the future? They're much worse ideologically. So things like critical legal studies is dominant, particularly in the Ivy League, but across the board. Politically, over 90% come from the same political stripe. And I started running into this problem when I was trying to hire people. And the other problem is the class background of the people who go to law school. I mean, by definition, once you are a lawyer, you're a member of this professional managerial class, but the possibility you might be a dissident within it was much higher if you had class or life experience background going into it that was different than the professional class. Increasingly, you have very few working class kids who ever make it to law school now. And so 
I found that it was very hard to find quality people to hire. And it was striking and kind of stunning how bad it had deteriorated. In fact, is what led me to take a deep dive into what has happened since 2000. You know, when I went to law school, there was still a decent number. It was low, but, you know, usually one out of five students would have some sort of diverse life experience background. Now it's maybe one out of 20, one out of 25. And you're going to find a much more at your local small law school than you have no shot for the most part with the Ivy League. They're, They're a lost cause. And it's all degraded ideologically, intellectually, capability, competence. They've been taught that the law is whatever I want it to be. They've taught to how to lie to themselves about the law, lie to others about it in order to just manifest their own class prejudices and political prejudices into the law. And that's why you have all these corporate law firms with their so-called pro bono clinics that all keep aligning in the same political ideological direction. It's why all of these law firms, even nominally conservative law firms, would not represent the president of the United States in an election challenge. I mean, imagine that. A billionaire, a president of the United States, not a single corporate law firm in America would represent him. And when they had people on their staffs who wanted to, they fired those people. That's the status of where the legal academy is going. It's deteriorated to an extraordinary degree. It's unbelievable that you and I lived through the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was a moment where uh, I was deliriously happy to be able to observe that, to be alive for that moment in history. But then to realize that maybe not even half a lifetime later in my own country, I mean, I'm happy for people in Eastern Europe, you know, that's great, good for them. But in my own country, things are worse than they've been at any point in my life. And I have, I don't know how to estimate the percentage, but let's say a very substantial chunk of people and the overwhelming majority of the elites, if not all of them, are ferociously hostile to me and everything I stand for. It's a bizarre situation. I mean, day in and day out, people like you and me live in this society where the elites couldn't have greater contempt for us. And we have to somehow make our way in this society where at every turn, they're trying to harm, undermine, ridicule, and demonize us. I mean, I'm glad the Berlin Wall fell, but I guess history didn't end there. Not at all. And, you know, that's what was interesting about this book that I read, The Managerial Class on Trial. And while I don't agree with some of its uh, prescriptive solutions, I thought its analysis was really quite revelatory, which is that essentially you've had three different variations of managerial class power in the 20th century. Two of them failed, fascism and communism. But that didn't stop the managerial class from continuing its near monopoly on power in the developed world, especially because it was just the corporate liberal version of it, which is now a woke corporate liberal version of it in the West. And we see it with the EU in the European Union. We see it in the warmongering that's taking place in the war in Ukraine. We see it in the United States. Even when Trump or Bush or whoever was, it didn't matter who was president, the administrative state kept growing and expanding. And the administrative state is a bunch of clerical bureaucrats of professional class, managerial class, credentialed class types running and governing the rest of us without democratic restriction or restraint. And we see increasingly without regard or respect for the rule of law. They don't even go through the Administrative Procedures Act requirements of notice and comment, which is just more of a show of democracy than its functionality. And the the Biden administration just does this on steroids. They use the pandemic initially, and now they just do it no matter what the circumstances are. And we're to the point where they honestly think, well, if we just relabel the Ministry of Truth, people will be okay with it. You know, I mean, we have this ministry of, you know, this dis- disinformation governance board, which I, I mean, that's honestly more Orwellian than Orwell's original. Oh, yeah. And th- now they're complaining that there's been disinformation about the disinformation governance board. You can't make this stuff up. That was a, a literal Babylon B parody just a couple of uh, months ago. <laughs> yeah, was exactly. The- exactly. And then Politico just ran a headline saying that they're complaining about misinformation about the disinformation board. <laughs> okay, well, they're getting a taste of their own medicine. Before I forget, I have a couple of questions submitted by listeners that I'd I'd like to run by you and get your opinions on. Now, of course, we know that the vaccine mandate for medical personnel was overturned in the UK and those people were able to come back to work. Not so, so far in the US, at least we're talking about facilities that take Medicare, which is the overwhelming majority of them. But I got this question and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Uh, 
gentleman writes, I'm a doctor and I lost my hospital privileges because I didn't take the vaccine. I have natural immunity from natural COVID infection in August 2021. I know many people in healthcare who were either fired or lost staff appointments over this CMS and other state mandates. None of this was justified by science. It was all politics and fear. When and how does Mr. Barnes think we can seek justice? When can we file lawsuits and punish these lunatics? Is there any hope on that? Yeah, so in the States, even with the medical, anybody receiving Medicare or Medicaid could be subject to a vaccine mandate. It had two big carve-outs, as explicitly referenced by the Supreme Court, which was you could still seek a religious exemption or a medical exemption. And so in my view, if you have prior immunity, that should count as a medical exemption. They're disputing that, but that would be subject to litigation. But almost everybody that has an objection to the vaccine They don't realize that it's a religious objection, but under American law, it is. A religious objection does not require institutionalized, organized religious permission. Indeed, you can be an atheist, and that's considered as much a religious accommodation as being a deist or being a theist. And so the people underappreciate the power and potency of a religious accommodation. I drafted a sort of exemplar version of that that people could copy and paste. Still there at my locals board, vivabarnslaw.locals.com. And you can go into the search engine and find the religious objection exemplar letter. But that's where there's robust protection. And I'm suing Tyson Foods all across the country, have brought other suits and part of bringing other suits as well whenever a employer has denied a religious accommodation because the law still protects your religious rights to refuse a vaccine and to not suffer any employment consequence because of it in almost in most circumstances. And then the other one that I wanted to make sure and get to before I give it back to my own involves something you did as a young lawyer that some people have been interested in. And it had to do with work you did with a tribe in Wisconsin where they had two legal systems. You could use the U.S. legal system or you could take your case to the tribal elders. And apparently, according to you, most of the members of the tribe preferred the tribal elders on the grounds that they were concerned more with healing and recovery as opposed to punishment and jail. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I worked for the Ho-Chunk tribe. I clerked there. I had a great law professor in law school, Richard Monette. He was chief of his tribe for a period of time, one of the top Native American Indian trial lawyers in, in the United States. And it's still called Indian law in the U.S. for those people that sometimes object to the label. And he got me a job working for the Ho-Chunk Nation tribe because they were trying to create a new tribal court system that would be respected by the local outsiders because the Ho-Chunk had created a casino that was highly successful in Western Wisconsin. And it was also a paying job, which was great. They needed a law clerk to help integrate tribal traditions into these Anglo-Saxon legal traditions that would get the respect and attention and appreciation of the non-tribal members who had either contractual or employment relationships with the tribe. Most of the you know, non-tribal members picked the traditional, pick that new court system, but the option was given to tribal members to pick that system or the traditional tribal elder system. Pretty much every tribal member picked the tribal elder system. And there are two things that are fascinating. One was in just creating the new court system, we created a court system that looked like a U.S. court system. So the judge sits high up. Tribal members came in and immediately objected. They're like, what are you doing uh, high up there? You should be at the same level as me. I know something I had never even thought about until then. And I realized, wow, this instinctive reaction that a system that we've grown accustomed to, to where we physically defer to the judge because the judge is physically elevated above us is something they instinctively objected to. But otherwise, the other aspect was the tribal elders had broader experience more life experience, and a broader understanding that we should focus on remedies, not focus on making a political statement in a case, not focus on punishment because they just saw punishment did not work as a remedy. And they look for ways to reunify the community, to heal the underlying issue so that the community would be maximally productive going forward. And I figured out by witnessing both systems over that summer If I myself was ever in a dispute with the tribe, I would always pick the tribal elder system, not the tribal legal system I helped create there, 
I would still pick the tribal elder system because their collective experience and instinctive sense of justice was simply much better than anything the Anglo-Saxon system can or has offered to this day. Well, I was thinking to myself, if only we could have recourse to the Ho-Chunk tribe elders when we have conflicts, I would vastly prefer that to the, the system we have now, of course. Hey, everybody, we're going to take a minute from our conversation with Robert Barnes about the various outrages in American society to talk about yet another outrage. And of course, that's the situation with health care. We have talked quite a bit on this program over the years about the way government distortion and third-party payment has led to a disaster in health care. But on the other hand, crowd health's disruptive technology puts your health care decisions back in your hands, saving you money and cutting out the middlemen. It's not insurance. It's what insurance should be. So forget about deductibles, networks, complicated exclusions, or co-pays. That's all gone. You see any doctor you want, you pay the first $500 and submit any bills from there. And the crowd health community takes care of the rest. You pay one low monthly total to fund your account, which is less than $200 a month for most people. And 100% of your monthly contribution directly funds and reduces the health care costs of the community. It totally reverses the vicious incentives that got the health care system into this mess in the first place. Well, Stop paying health insurance companies your hard-earned dollars. Go to joincrowdhealth.com now and experience freedom from health insurance. Right now, you can get your first six months for just $99 per month. That's almost 50% off the normal price and a lot less than a high-deductible health care plan. Just go to joincrowdhealth.com and use promo code WOODS at sign up. That's joincrowdhealth.com, promo code WOODS. Crowd health is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for health care. Terms and conditions may apply. Even though you, obviously, you have expertise in the law, you know, and I, I'm a PhD historian, but I, I don't confine myself to that. I have opinions on a wide range of things, as do you. And so, as a matter of fact, I have a guy, I have a private group for my supporters, and I have a guy who listens to you so carefully that he supplies us with detailed notes of every time you do a podcast, anything like that, he's got detailed notes about the things you said because he wants to urge as many of my people as possible to listen to you and hear what you have to say. And so I look and I think, geez, I, he is so much better informed than I am about all these other things. So I feel like I can ask you about other things. And in particular, I guess it's your opinion that you would say that a majority of people are basically anti-war. They might not make it their number one issue, but a majority of people certainly, let's say five years ago or 10 years ago even, when the war on terror wars were really raging still, would have said, yeah, this is a waste of time and money. We shouldn't be doing it. But in this day and age, like right now, 2022, with Ukraine and Russia going on and everybody waving Ukraine flags, how do you assess the state of American opinion? It's still very much that same instinct. I mean, the way I outline it for people is that there's a reason why they always have to lie to get us into war. You know, we're not the Vikings or the Mongols. We're not societies or civilizations that thrive and survive based on foreign wars. We're uh, societies and civilizations that for the last several centuries have seen war as a way to fall apart, a way to collapse, a way to suffer, a way where the world gets worse. And the way examples I give to this politically in the United States are, you know, aside from our founders who people like John Quincy Adams, who made his great speech to Congress, where he said, we do not go abroad searching for monsters to destroy, lest in effect we become the monster ourselves, that that is deeply ingrained in the American public consciousness. And that's why there's so many false flags that get us into conflict in the United States. To some degree, that's true around the globe. But you look at it politically. The so-called war-winning party, when they have faced an election after they've supposedly won a war, have almost universally lost, uh, especially if they got us into that war in the first place. Democrats get wiped out in 1920, get hit badly again in 1946, just as Churchill did in, in the UK. After I mean, he wins the war and they throw him out of office. And then in 1952, after Korean War, the Democrats get taken out from the White House. 1968, Democrats lose the White House for getting us involved in the Vietnam War. Similarly, you know, Poppy Bush wins the Iraq War in 1991, hits 91% approval. A year later, he's challenged within his own primary, challenged within by the biggest independent vote getter up, up to that point in American political history, and loses the White House with one of the lowest vote totals of any incumbent in history. 
Similarly, when 1999, Clinton escalates in Serbia, Sudan, Somalia, and elsewhere, Gore is seen as more of a warmonger than W was in 2000. Gore loses. W, of course, gets us involved in war, and after he has mission accomplished in 2005, by 2006, the Republicans get wiped out in the House and Senate and then lose the White House two years later because the warmonger Hillary Clinton was seen as such a warmonger and lost based on that vote alone to Barack Obama. And then when Obama decided to escalate a national conflict in 2014, 2015, Donald Trump beats Hillary Clinton, again, the warmonger, are perceived as such. And the number one correlation between people who switched between 2012 and 2016 from Obama to Trump were counties that had experienced unusual rates of military deaths overseas in the prior 20 years. So the Americans are in, and, and this is like, they do fake polls all the time. People like Richard Barris, who did honest polling from the very beginning, it would ask questions like, would you be in favor of American troops on the ground? Would you be in favor of this policy if you thought it increased the risk of nuclear war? Would you be in favor of this policy if you if thought it meant just a ground war with Russia? And oh, 75 to 80% of Americans would say, no, we're not interested in that. And the, what the media will ask is more generic questions like, do you support Ukraine? Do you support, you know, do you support a no-fly zone without telling people what that actually is? When they tell people actually what it is, people are like, whoa, no, 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 not interested in that. So the biggest myths governments have to pitch is that their public is behind their warmongering and foreign wars. And the reality is that is very rare, almost anywhere in the globe, but especially in America. And what the Vietnam War partially distracted from that was the anti, what I call the anti-American left took over the anti-war cause, which was not its history. Historically, the anti-war cause were America firsters in World War II and after World War I, Republican senators like Gerald Nye, who held the war racketeering committee meetings, all of those great things. I mean, the 1920s went after the war ma manufacturers and warmongers through official congressional hearings and full findings. That shifted in the 1960s because of the Cold War and the anti-American left took over the anti-war cause. And what that did is that antagonized the anti-war ordinary American. All of a sudden, you know, previously anti-war causes were for the soldier, to protect the soldier. The anti-American left made it anti-soldier, made it anti-American, said that, you know, the America itself is just this vicious, violent country that wants to kill everybody. A lot of communist propaganda, frankly. And the anti-war left, the so-called anti-war left that was anti-American, really should have received checks from the war machine because they did the war machines business. They still do to this day. I mean, I like a lot of these guys. They provide good, interesting, independent information and analysis, but their anti-American bias makes them politically counterproductive in the American political electorate. But no one should be confused that these constituencies are actually pro-war because they're not. You see that in the fact that outside of rare instances, you're not seeing mass numbers of people sign up to volunteer anywhere. You see it when the actual rubber hits the road at, at an election after a war has taken place. But the American people are still as instinctively anti-war as ever. But look at Trump. That's where Trump read the tea leaves, and he is the major politician calling for peace in Ukraine right now. Why? Because he's a marketer at heart, and he understands where the populist base actually is in America, and it's not on the warmongering side, despite the Sean Hannity's of the world, you know, whoring for war every five seconds. Yeah, yeah, I know it, I know it. I would love to hear an expressly populist appeal along these lines that, look, these are the same people who want to distract you and get you all excited about this thing or that thing, this, that, or the other thing all around the world. These are the same people who are trying to ruin your life, who are trying to take your own country away from you. Everywhere you turn, whether it's making your prices go through the roof or they're propagandizing your kids or whatever it is, or they're demonizing you, or they're running you through some brainwashing seminar at your job, whatever it is, they loathe and despise you. Oh, and they want you to go support whatever crazy imperial project they have. How about tell them to go jump at a lake because the first country we need to fix is our own. I'd like to hear a little more clarity on that because men would that. Now, of course, they'd go hysterical. I mean, that person would be portrayed as the world's biggest Nazi, even though that would be kind of the opposite of the Nazis. We have no territorial ambitions whatsoever. We just want to have a home where we can feel like we're at home and we're not being harangued 24 hours a day. I'd like to hear that. Oh, precisely. I mean, and that's our American history. You go back and you listen to John Quincy Adams' speech or, or read that speech, and it's a brilliant, beautiful speech that says, we will be an exemplar to the world by how we preserve and protect the liberty and freedom at home. And that is how we light the torch of liberty around the globe, we cannot 
light the torch of liberty by putting our soldiers and people under foreign flags. That is not the flag of liberty to fight other people's battles in foreign exotic locations under flags other than our own. And that's why we don't go abroad searching for monsters to destroy because we will ultimately become the monster ourselves as is reflected in failed war after failed war after failed war. I mean, how many times are we going to build up some foreign army, then intervene at the last second just to fail ultimately? Did it in Korea? Did it in Vietnam? Did it in Afghanistan? Did it in Iraq? Did it in in Syria? Did it in Libya? It's just been failure, 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 and failure. And enough's enough. Why should, as Ross Perot said in 1992, not one drop of American blood for all the oil in the world. Yeah. And there's a reason why he was so popular. There's a reason why he was close to being the only independent to ever win the presidency in American history. And that was his core appeal. And that was after the most, quote unquote, popular war in American history. So, you know, what I've told people is if you find yourself on the stage with George Soros and Klaus Schwab and the European Union and Hillary Rodham Clinton and Mitt Romney, get off the stage immediately because you're on the wrong stage. That's not the populist tradition. That's not the American tradition. You're not conserving anything when you go out whoring for war. And the people who benefit from war are the same globalist, imperialist elites, and it's never the ordinary person. That's the person who dies on the battlefield or suffers permanent injury, psychological, physical, or biological, or otherwise. And it's the person who at home is going to face higher cost, is going to face declining economic prospects because they're not doing this for you. I mean, here you have people saying that let's not worry about fertilizer. Let's not worry about food. Let's not worry about fuel. You know, you got Klaus Schwab saying you're going to eat bugs and like it. You're going to own nothing and like it. You can't be part of the Great Reset Agenda and be part of anything that we call American by our founding fathers tradition. When people tell me uh, being anti-war is anti-American, I say there's nothing more American than being anti-war. And that goes back to our founders. Just read George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, or any of the other great American leaders. Huey P. Long, who said the Spanish-American War was nothing more than imperialist project built on a lie. Remember the Maine to hell with Spain. It was a lie. The sinking of the Lusitania, it was the story surrounding it was mostly a lie. The Gulf of Tonkin, mostly a lie. Incubator babies in Iraq, mostly a lie. Weapons of mass destruction, mostly a lie. And they're just lying to us now about Ukraine with Snake Island and goes to Kiev. We're backing neo-Nazis and a corrupt grifter regime that is neck deep with the Biden administration. Why in the world do we want to cover for the Biden family's corruption at the expense of American lives, at the expense of American liberty? So there's nothing American about being involved in this war. It's anti-American and anti-founders to be involved in this war or any war. Wow. Okay. You just won up to me. That was even better than my rant. Let me ask you about 2024 then. I mean, obviously, I could just leave it there. What do you think about 2024? But obviously, on the Republican side, it's going to be very interesting. I don't think the Mitt Romney wing is just going to sit back and assume that we've lost the party forever. Presumably, they're going to launch some kind of fight, but they have no, they have a lot of money, but they have no enthusiasm whatsoever. I mean, you could, you know, Ron, somebody like Ron Paul was filling up small stadiums on college campuses. And Mitt Romney, they have to have extremely tight photographs in order not to show how many empty seats there are. So they have that side of it. But the other side is you have Trump versus DeSantis. What's your opinion on any of this? I think it's Trump's to get if he wants it and if if his health is good. And I think DeSantis has already told people that he will not run if Trump does. So the person they'll probably try to field against Trump is maybe Pence, maybe Pompeo. The problem is that the party is so overwhelmingly populist. And a good example, this has been Ohio. So, you know, at the beginning of this war, J.D. Vance was at fourth or fifth in the Ohio Senate polls. He didn't look like he was, I think he had eight, 10% chance according to the betting markets to, to win the primary. And he was the only one to come out and say he was opposed to a no-fly zone. He was opposed to further intervention. He was opposed to counterproductive sanctions. He was opposed to all of that. And what happens? By the end of it, he ends up first in Ohio. And that was happening before Trump came in and endorsed him. And on a Tuesday, I believe he'll be the next Republican nominee from the state of Ohio. And that may means, given where Ohio's current politics are, you'll have one of the most populous senators to get to the United States Senate in about a century. 
And so I think that shows you where the zeitgeist is in the Republican Party. And I think Trump will crush. The thing that's discouraging and deterring the Romneys of the world from even challenging Trump is can they handle the humiliation of an 80-20 loss in places like Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and other states? So I think that their goal with Trump is to still try to use January 6th to try to saddle him, try to uh, use New York investigations to go after him. I don't think any of that will work ultimately. And I think my betting odds would be about four to one. I would make Trump about an 80% favorite to be president come 2025. Wow. Oh, gee, I, but what's your personal, forget about what, what's likely to happen. What's your personal opinion if you if somebody pinned you down and said, well, how about me? I'm pinning you down. Would you prefer Trump or would you prefer a DeSantis? I still probably right now would prefer Trump primarily because he has the best marketing instincts of any political figure I can remember in a long time. And his instincts are populist. And what I would prefer is to focus on improving Trump, translating those instincts into actual personnel and policy, because that's what failed in the first term. He made poor personnel decisions repeatedly that translated into poor policy consequences and outcomes repeatedly. Now, like, I think if he gets back in, he will, in fact, pardon Snowden. I think he will pardon Assange. There are things he didn't do. It. He's already said he'll pardon everybody related to January 6th. I think there, he realizes he made mistakes at the end. Now, Trump's been my client. I represented him during part of the election disputes and controversies. I like him personally. He is just, his limitation is, He's, he's the guy who sells the building. He doesn't engineer the building. He doesn't architect the building. And it's tough to sell a building when you got the wrong architect and the wrong engineer. And for most of his first term, he had the wrong architects and the wrong engineers. I'm hopeful that he comes to fully appreciate that and value that. The fact that he chose the most prominent anti-war voice of any Republican Senate candidate running in any state in the J.D. Vance, and then it was risky because in the past, Trump had not endorsed anyone who was risky to have a high risk chance of losing at the time as perceived in the polls. Meant that, okay, he's making some better judgments and there's still some questionable judgments mixed in, but I'm hopeful that we get a much better Trump in his second term than we would have had he been considered the winner after 2020. So I think that Trump is still probably better than DeSantis. DeSantis has better personnel and policies in terms of implementing, but I don't know if his, what his instincts are on like foreign policy, for example. That's still right, a big but, mystery. Right, that is, that is, and and he could, this is why I, I would have to unfortunately go from really liking him to really not liking him, and that would make me sad. On the other hand, the fact that when the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine occurred and everybody felt, I mean, Randy Weingarten, you know, who's, who heads the major teachers union, posted on Twitter, here is my statement about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You know, because we were all waiting with bated breath to hear what Randy Weingarten had to say about it. And you'll never guess, Robert, it was just a bunch of platitudes of the sort we've heard from every single other person. But DeSantis didn't say a word. For all I know, he still has, not but at least at the time, weeks went by, not a word, and everybody was outraged. Why isn't he saying anything? So on Twitter, I would say something like, all right, listen, if it makes you any happier, I'll say this. I'll say this for DeSantis. This aggression will not stand. We stand for democracy. You happy now? Okay, there are some platitudes that you were desperately seeking. The fact that he didn't, I thought that was actually an interesting sign. Now, in terms of Trump and personnel, I totally, obviously everybody has to agree with you on that. But I don't think we can just say, well, his big problem was he didn't appoint the right people. We have to stop and really, really pause to consider the depth of that problem. Because you, Robert Barnes, would not have made that mistake. If you were elected president, there's absolutely no way that you would have blindly, in effect, appointed people, either you were urged to appoint or you did a little research, you would know exactly the people to appoint, or at the very least, you would know the people to ask about which people should be appointed. No doubt about it. There's no way you would have made that mistake. So to give him a pass on this and say, well, you know, nobody's perfect. No, 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 no. This was almost the most important thing he had. And he was so cavalier about it. To, I mean, he almost brought in Elliot Abrams until he realized, oh, wait, Elliot Abrams didn't like me personally. Okay, well, that's not the worst problem with Elliot Abrams, you know? Whereas DeSantis's issue is uh, not only is he good on personnel, he's better with the press, I think, than Trump is. And he doesn't let his personal, he doesn't let his temper get the better of him. And I think he's easier for most American adults to admit they like. So I think these are advantages DeSantis has. 
Oh, no doubt. And if I had more confidence in DeSantis's foreign policy instincts, then I would say DeSantis would make a better president than Trump. Okay, uh, yeah. But that's where I still have questions. And Trump's instincts are just off the charts. The fact that the whole, I mean, Republicans, every single Republican in the Senate, all but eight in the House, you know, look at accelerating the war in Ukraine by voting for sanctions. And Trump, two days later, comes out and endorses the anti-war advance and comes out and makes a public statement that says, this is nuts. Everybody should be at the table and we should get a peace deal. You have Noam Chomsky the other day saying, shockingly, and from his perspective, Trump is the only major public figure in the entire Western world calling for peace. So it's his instincts are still off the charts for however screwed up all of his policy personnel people were. And in the end, at your big global war level conflict, the personnel weren't able to trick him into that. They were able to keep more troops in places than he knew existed. But Pompeo tried to get him to go to war with Iran. He didn't. They tried to get him to go to further war with Russia. He didn't. They tried to militarize the conflict with China. He never took the bait on that. And so it's like those instincts are still just off the charts. And I would like to have confidence that DeSantis has the same level instincts. I agree with you. I've been watching his Ukraine commentary, and he has not taken the bait on being a warmonger on that machine. But I would like to know what those instincts are before I would say I have more confidence in a DeSantis presidency than a Trump presidency. Yeah, I hear you. I have a feeling that after listening to this conversation, a bunch of people are going to want to start following Robert Barnes. What's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, everything's at vivabarneslaw.locals.com. So it's, uh, that's where we put up exclusive content. That's where uh, we put up any links to any other content. Also, it's a great community. It's like the community you're describing. In other words, you get, I get most of my insights and information and leads increasingly not from anywhere else on other social media or websites, but from other members of the board who point out certain stories, certain items, certain links, certain ideas. So it's really fun and fantastic, and uh, it's cool to do. All right, excellent. So I'm going to put a link to that up on our show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 2118. Well, I enjoy this. I can't imagine how busy of a guy you are. So I really appreciate you carving out some time for me today. Thanks so much. Oh, absolutely. It's great fun. All right, that's going to do it for today. We had a great session the other night in my School of Life program. We talked about college alternatives. I got all my members a scholarship to the Praxis program, which is an amazing apprenticeship program that gets people really, really good jobs. And then for those people who do want to go to college, we're doing another session later this month on debt-free college and how to swing that. So it's a great program, My School of Life. Head over to tomschoolalife.com and sign up to be notified when we open our doors again because you do not want to miss out on this. All right, see you all tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.